I don't know if you are aware of this, but here at the Choctaw congregation, we have what's called a child safety program. Child safety program. Uh, one of our deacons, Don Furch, uh, is the one who administers it, coordinates it. Uh, this program is a condition imposed by our insurance provider, actually, that requires that we verify the background of those teaching or working with our children and our youth, and that's, that's a good thing. And we have to have that program if they're going to insure us. Uh, it also has other safety rules for classrooms and outings and events and so on and so forth. You know, in this world and even in the church, unfortunately, uh, we have to protect our children against uh, predators that would come in among us and try to harm us. That's a sad thing to say, but churches are a target many times uh, of people who would try to infiltrate and perhaps uh, harm our, our youngest uh, members. Uh, in the same way, there are spiritual predators that try to infiltrate the church to do spiritual damage, spiritual harm, to God's people as well. Paul refers to these as wolves in Acts chapter 20, verse 29. He gives an admonition to the elders of Ephesus and he says, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. And so we also need to protect the church against these type of people as well. And of course, this is the subject of John's admonition in John chapter, or in 1 John rather, chapter four, begin, beginning in verse one. And I'll just read the first verse. It says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And so in this particular passage, John warns the brethren that in his absence, they had to be on guard for those who would teach things contrary to the spirit and to the teachings of Christ. Of course, we know that John is referring to teachers and prophets when he speaks of spirits. He's not talking about apparitions or dreams, he's, he's referring to uh, men that would go in and, and, uh, and teach in the churches. You know, I believe that John's, um, John's warning was not only for the first century church, but for every congregation in every century, because every congregation in every century is susceptible to this type of, this type of infiltration. That each congregation uh, needs to be careful to judge or to test every teacher, every preacher, to make sure that they speak only God's word. Now, in John, 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 to 3, John kind of uh, gives the criteria uh, to help the church uh, do this testing of the spirit. So let me read verse two and three. He says, by this you know the spirit of God, Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist of which you have heard that it is coming, and now it is already in the world. Now in John's day, there was a certain false doctrine being taught that said in essence, uh, that Jesus was not really a human being. He wasn't really a fleshly man. Uh, they were teaching the idea that he really was an appearance as a spirit that looked like a man, a kind of a vision that looked like a man, but not really a man. And the reason for this false teaching was that uh, there was an effort to mix uh, ideas from Greek philosophy along with the teachings of Jesus Christ and kind of merge these two set of ideas together into one doctrine, one teaching. You know, the, the Greeks at the time taught that the flesh was evil. And so uh, a divine being could not inhabit sinful flesh. So they rejected the idea of incarnation and they replaced it with this idea which fit their philosophy. 
They started with a philosophy and then they tried to change the gospel around to make it fit their worldly idea of how things worked. Of course, they misunderstood that Jesus had to become a man. He had to become a human being so that He could live a thoroughly human life and offer a perfect human life as sacrifice or atonement for sin. Uh, the Hebrew writer says in Hebrew uh, chapter 10, by this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Notice he doesn't say the appearance of the body of Jesus Christ, but by the body, by the flesh itself of Jesus Christ. And so if Jesus was only a spirit, then no acceptable sacrifice was offered, no atonement was made for sin, and by consequence, no forgiveness uh, available for human beings. And so John establishes the uh, criteria for authenticity on this particular issue. He says, if someone does not acknowledge that Jesus is God become man, then he is a false prophet. He is a false teacher. Uh, this is the test on this particular issue. You know, the, the, this was the issue that was being you know, debated, if you wish, in the church, and John said, this is the test on this issue. If someone says to you that Jesus never really did come as a human being, or it wasn't really like that, they failed, they failed the test. So those who promoted the false teaching were to be rejected on the grounds that they were, as individuals, false prophets, and collectively they were part, as John says, part of the spirit of the Antichrist that existed at that time. And so the spirit of the Antichrist were all of those individuals and teachings that refused to believe and teach that Jesus was both divine and human simultaneously. That's the teaching of the New Testament. And I make a kind of a side note here, uh, this wasn't the first and it wasn't the last attempt by people to teach something other than Jesus being fully human, fully divine at the same time. And so John shows here several things. First of all, uh, there is correct and incorrect teaching being done. You know, people say, well, doctrine's not important. You know, love is what's important. Well, you don't, it's not either or. You, you need to have both. Love is important, but correct doctrine is also very, very important. John also shows that the church must discern based on the word which is which. Not how you feel about it, but based on God's word. That's how you discern what's true, what's accurate from what is not accurate. And thirdly, we see that this has been the case from the beginning. Of course, John was addressing one, just one issue here. I mean, this isn't the, the test for every issue, just for this one issue, one major false doctrine that was prevalent in his day. There are many false and incorrect teachings and teachers even today, and so for your protection, your protection, our protection, I wanted to give you a, a general way to determine uh, which is true and which is false in our day, because obviously there are only a few people that get into this pulpit, of course, but I know that many of you listen to lessons, listen to sermons online, you read books, you watch TV shows, you might even visit other places where speakers are speaking about religion. And so you need to be equipped to be able to discern what is true, what is accurate from what is not. So let's look at the criteria that is not valid. It's unfortunate that people use the wrong standards in order to judge who is a good teacher or a good preacher from one who is incorrect or downright false. I believe that it's because they use the same criteria to judge Bible teacher and preachers in order to judge business leaders or sports people. It's not the same criteria for these areas. 
So here are some characteristics that are not valid in testing the spirits. All right? First of all, dynamism. You know, someone being dynamic. A person you know, overwhelms us sometimes with the fact that they are very good speakers or perhaps they have a lot of education or they use educated language. Some teachers are persuasive or funny and they give an emotional charge. This is especially true for those who teach young people because young people are especially vulnerable to someone speaking to them who makes them laugh or who seems very dynamic and very energetic. Sometimes a man is well organized and has a great personality and you know, he can get things done. Many are impressed if a person is wealthy or well-dressed or modern or can relate to many different kinds of people. There are great, these things that I've just mentioned, they're great qualifications. And who doesn't want their preacher or their teachers to have some of these qualifications? But you know what? Not one of them is necessary to be accepted as a true prophet. Not a single one that I've just mentioned. Apollos in the Bible was well educated. He was persuasive. He was a dynamic orator who preached up a storm in Ephesus and he built up a following and you can read about that in Acts chapter 19. However, he was preaching an incomplete gospel and he had to be taught by Aquila and Priscilla more accurately the way of God. And yet, according to modern you know, criteria, he was, he's the man you want. Educated, dynamic, terrific speaker. And yet, <laughs> was teaching an incomplete gospel. In addition to this, Paul had to reteach and rebaptize his converts because of his inaccurate teaching. Thankfully, Apollos had the one criteria necessary for a good preacher. He had a teachable heart and he received the correction with humility so that he could go on and become an effective servant of the Lord by preaching the whole gospel. A wonderful lesson that we see there in Apollos. Another criteria that is not valid for judging if someone is uh, a true prophet, true teacher, true preacher. That's success or results. Success and results, not necessarily a qualification. We live in a success-oriented society. That means that we judge the value of a person by the success that that person has accumulated. That's why people are so shocked to learn that a rich and famous person is a alcoholic or as a child molester. We think, wow, they're successful, they've got money, they've got fame. What could possibly be wrong with them? And then we find out that in their private lives they got all kinds of things wrong with them. In our society, unfortunately, we equate material and social success with moral purity. The Jews were like this. They believed that if you were rich, it meant that you were blessed and that you were holy of God. That's why they stumbled when Jesus said, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 19, verse 24, they thought, are you kidding me? The Pharisees, they're the rich guys in our society. If they can't get into heaven, how can we get into heaven? So when we see a, a big church building, or we see a large following, or we see somebody having a high profile in our brotherhood, let's say, or nationally, we tend to equate this with the degree of spirituality and worse still, with biblical accuracy. I'm not saying that those who preach at big churches or those who have successful ministries or those who are in demand as speakers are heretics. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that size and success are not necessarily a criteria to determine accuracy. I mean, uh, the Pope draws millions of people wherever he goes. He's on television. He commands a worldwide audience, but how many people here tonight would say that he speaks and teaches the word of God accurately? And yet, as far as success, as far as visibility is concerned, as far as importance is concerned on the world stage, he has all of those things. And yet I 
I would, I would not guess, but I would put forth that any of our junior highs in this congregation could probably you know, uh, uh, show that man chapter and verse where he is not teaching accurately God's word. And so people are overwhelmed with the idea of importance and fame. Those things do not equate to accuracy. And then another thing that is not a criteria, and that is zeal. Zeal. Paul said of the Jews, for I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. Romans chapter 10, verse two. The Jews had an enthusiasm for their religion bordering on fanaticism. But Paul says that it wasn't according to the knowledge of the truth. The Muslims are quite zealous about converting people to their religion and they sacrifice for it, even the, their lives. And yet, Muhammad is not the savior. The Hindu dervishes, they dance and they froth at the mouth during their ceremonies, but Brahma or Nirvana are not what await us after death. And Pentecostal, our friends, the Pentecostals, you know, they roll around, they speak, they get hot and excited you know, during their services, but this activity does not substitute for true holiness or purity. That someone is excited, that someone is emotional about their religion, even if it's Christianity, that's a good thing. But zeal is no replacement or sign of true knowledge or authority in spiritual matters. That's not how you judge if something is accurate or not, by how excited somebody is. All right, enough of the negative. What should we be looking for when we, quote, test the spirits? Well, when we're looking for the true prophet, what are the signs? First of all, I would say true, true prophets speak and do God's word. They speak and do God's word. The basic way to judge is to compare what they say and what they do to God's word. Jesus commanded that the apostles teach others to observe all that Jesus taught, Matthew 28, 20. This involves several things, several things that modern day prophets, teachers, pro uh, preachers need to do. First of all, they must teach all the things that Jesus taught. The doctrine must be according to Christ and everything that Christ teaches must be taught. Secondly, they must themselves obey the teachings. No quicker way of spotting a phony as seeing as if he is really doing the things that he's teaching others to do. You know, if you're a teacher in the church, a preacher in the church, a leader in the church, you can't, you can't you know, say, you know, uh, do what I say, but don't do what I do. You not only have to teach accurately, you have to live accurately as well. I'm not talking about perfection, but the things that the teacher encourages the church to strive for must be the things that that teacher is also striving for making an effort, and, it has, and what's the difference? The difference is hopefully it's visible that that person's making the effort. And also they must train others to obey the teaching, show them how to do it, encourage them to be teachers uh, themselves. You know, uh, I did a, a little seminar on church growth in Cushing a couple of weeks ago, the Cushing Church, and one of the things that we were talking about there, because their elders were there and their leaders were there, and I said to them, the greatest power that the elders have is the ability to empower other people to serve Christ. That's how you see the word working in leadership. Leadership empowers others to serve, to know, to grow. In the religious world, there are many who like to speak and there are many who do it well, and there are many who write books, and there are many who are on TV. But the true prophet is the one who speaks and does what Jesus teaches. It's, it's not a new passage, right? You can tell them by their, by their fruit, of course. Secondly, true prophets 
magnify Christ. You know you're in the presence of a true prophet if the result of his ministry to you is that you love Jesus more, not the minister more. One of the prayers that preachers say a lot in, in their private discussions with one another usually sounds like this. I'm preaching and I'm, try to, I'm trying to get out of the way. I'm trying to get out of the way so that people can see Christ. I don't want them to see me, I want them to see Jesus Christ. The purpose of ministry is not to advance the career of the minister, it's to advance the cause of Christ, the gospel, the church. Jesus' ministry ended at the cross. Peter and Paul's ministry ended in a Roman execution. I remember a brother in Christ, his name, he's still alive of course, his name is Johnny Panisi, and Johnny Panisi was one of my professors at Oklahoma Christian. He taught about missions, you know, missiology. He taught courses in that area of expertise. And I remember him telling me one day, he said, you know, when I was out in the mission field, he was out in Brazil and he served there many, many years, he says, I couldn't wait to get back to the United States and maybe get a job, you know, get my PhD, get a job as a, as a, a teacher in a Christian university, and oh, it would be wonderful, you know, and so on and so forth. And he did that for a while. And he found out that he just couldn't do it anymore. And you know what he did? He turned around and went back to the mission field. He wanted to be on the front lines. He wanted to be you know, where the action was. He said the action isn't, I mean it's, it's a valid ministry to teach and be a professor, I, I'm not criticizing that, but for Johnny Panisi who was a preacher, who was a teacher, for him the place to be was with the people on the ground teaching them the, the gospel. True prophets are focused on service, not self. Their zeal is for the church, not the program. Another OC, uh, uh, I, you know, wonderful person, he, he's, he's been gone now for many, many years, but that was Dr. Raymond Kelsey. And Dr. Kelsey was asked during a public forum at the lectureship one year, somebody in the audience said, Dr. Kelsey, who do you think is the greatest preacher in the brotherhood? Now, you know, that, was a, that was a loaded question. I mean, how, how do you, you know, who do you pick? There are a lot, of, a lot of great speakers and so on and so forth, high profile people. And don't forget, a lot of the speakers at the lectureship were actually sitting in the audience at the time. And I'll never forget his answer. He said, the greatest preacher in our brotherhood is probably somebody that we've never heard of. Somebody who just does his work quietly in the name of the Lord who preaches the gospel and baptizes those who are coming to Christ and, and mourns with those who are burying loved ones and helps young people as they're getting married and long nights and early mornings at the hospital and, and so on and so forth, taking care of a thousand and one little things that come up during the week. He said he's the greatest preacher in our brotherhood because his goal is not to be known by the brethren, his goal is to be known by Christ. That's why he's the greatest. And so when you see people being baptized, when you see people returning to God, when you see people sacrificing to serve Christ, when you see people living holy lives because of their faith, when you see people who know and obey God's words, you know that they are receiving ministry from a true prophet of God. I was talking to my wife this afternoon and as we, as we do very often, we, you know, the preachers talk about their kids and if they're old enough, their grandkids, and then the third thing they talk about is the church. That's pretty much 90% of the content of their conversation with their wives. And I said to, um, I said to my wife, my greatest satisfaction, the greatest gift that God gives me in this ministry of mine is when I see someone freed from the burden of guilt because of the gospel that I've preached to them. 
That is the greatest gift. To see someone either come to Christ or to have that person finally understand that they're forgiven, that the load of guilt they've carried for so long is finally removed from them and they really get it and they begin to rejoice in Christ and have that joy that I'm, I'm really, really saved. I'm really, really going to heaven. You know, that's, that's the food that Jesus talked about. Well, anyways, one of the courses, you know, when he said, you know, the, he was in the, the town there with the Samaritan woman and he, he said, I have food that you don't know anything about. Well, those of us who preach and those of us who teach the gospel and those of us who bring others to Christ, we have this food nobody understands and that food sustains us in our, in our spirit. And then perhaps another criteria that you can look for, true prophets promote unity in the church. When you study this subject in the New Testament, you'll notice that one feature that is common about false prophets and false teachers is that they create division wherever they go. In Romans uh, chapter 16, verse, uh, verse 17, Paul writes this. I mean, they were having that problem back then. He says, now I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you learned and turn away from them. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, chapter 1, verse 10, Paul says again, now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you may be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. Paul is exhorting them to stop dividing by following different teachers. And so, when a man begins to worry about his following, rather than his teaching, he's on the wrong road. When people begin to favor one teacher over another to the point of quarreling or gossip, when churches are feeling tensions and losing the peace of Christ, usually, not always, but usually, it's because somebody somewhere in that church, in that congregation, is teaching something which is contrary to Christ. True prophets, work towards unity, harmony, peace, love, growth, even at the expense of their own pride. You know, John the Baptist said, and said rightly, he must increase and I must decrease. He must increase and I must decrease. And so a true prophet does work towards harmony, as I said, at the expense of his pride or ambition or valid complaints about what is fair. Sometimes stuff happens that's not fair. So what? What's important is not what's fair or how you're being treated. What's important is, is the cause of Christ moving forward. Paul took a vow and he went to the temple to sacrifice in order to maintain peace and help the weaker Jewish brethren who thought he was out to destroy their way of life. And what did he get for that good action? What did he get for that compromise? What did he get for that flexibility? Well, he nearly got killed because of it. He got arrested. The crowd wanted to tear him apart. You know, when I read about that story in the book of Acts, I don't hear at all in his discourse, in his discussion, I don't hear anything about, well, if that's the thanks I'm going to get, if that's my reward, after all I've done for this church, The only thing a true prophet will not compromise is God's word. He will, however, sacrifice his opinion and many times have to give up his, the demands of his own ego or his rights in order to support the weak, in order to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And I say, if the prophets and in the teachers and the preachers, if they can't do it, if they're unwilling to do it, how will the members know how to do it when it's put upon them to make this kind of sacrifice? We read the New Testament and think that their problems were unique to that time and place, but the New Testament talks about basic problems and it talks about universal problems that have always affected the church in every generation. So, 
No matter how long it takes for Jesus to return, we will always have to deal with personal sin. Always, we're sinners. We're forgiven sinners, but we're still sinners. And we'll always have the challenge of growing spiritually. Why? Our spirit wants to grow, but our flesh is always pulling us back. That struggle is always going to be there. And we'll always have the task of evangelizing the world, as well as dealing with church growth issues and the need to be aware of false teachers. That's always going to be there. We are stronger, however, if we are prepared to recognize what characteristics distinguish the true from the false, so we will never become victims of those who would destroy the peace and the love that we share in the church of our Lord. In this church, you know, I tell people when they ask me you know, about Choctaw and you know, where are you preaching and all that kind of stuff, and well, how big, is, you know, first question is always, how big is that church, as if it matters? You know, how big is your church? You know, and uh, taking a cue from uh, Marty, I always tell them, well, it's, just a, it's under 3,000. <laughs> that kind of puts everything into perspective right there. <laughs> But one thing I do tell them, the, the thing I do boast, I don't boast about the numbers. What I boast about is in a few years we will be celebrating our 75th anniversary as a congregation. And that's, you know, that's unusual because the lifespan of a congregation is usually about 50 years. I don't know if you knew that, but it's about 50 years. The thing I really boast about and boast in the Lord, not in myself, 75 years, never any division. Amen. Nobody just took up 15, 20 people and took off and tried to start their own thing. No one ever managed to split the eldership where the elders are fighting with each other. That's, that's not happened and I pray that it will never happen. But the thing I boast about, I boast about that longevity. I boast about the wisdom that our leaders have had and the um, humility that our members have expressed in maintaining that unity. Don't you think that Satan would dearly love to destroy this church? Absolutely. And so let's, let's be careful. Uh, I'm, I'm very confident about those who are teaching here, uh, our leaders, our elders, uh, but I do know that you are uh, looking at other areas that you read and listen to other people who speak and who teach. And I wanted to make sure that you were well equipped to be able to discern between what's true and what's false according to God's word. And so if you would like to share in the peace and share in the love and the unity of this congregation, but yet you, you're, you're not a Christian, then of course the invitation is always there before you to repent of your sins, to confess your faith in Jesus Christ, to be immersed in the waters of baptism for the remission of your sins, and that you might receive the Holy Spirit. The offer is always there. And of course, if you need to be restored because you have been unfaithful in some way, or if you, are not, um, you have not given us yet the right hand of fellowship uh, to place yourself under the direction of our elders, well then this is a good opportunity to do any of those things as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.